हेलो वेलकम टू दी एट्थ वीक ऑफ दिस कोर्स सो इन द लास्ट टू वीक्स वी स्टडीड अबाउट पॉइंट एस्टिमेशन पॉइंट एस्टिमेशन बेसिकली मीन्स दैट वी वर ट्राइंग टू गेट अ पॉइंट एस्टिमेटर और यू कैन से अ सिंगल वैल्यू फॉर योर पॉपुलेशन पैरामीटर वी वर ट्राइंग टू एस्टिमेट दी पॉपुलेशन पैरामीटर देयर एंड फॉर दैट वी केम अप विद अ सिंगल पॉइंट एस्टिमेट and there we saw different methods and we talked about unbiased estimation also and em algorithm also now we are going to learn about hypothesis testing we will first understand what is the concept of hypothesis testing and then we will see how we can set up the hypothesis and finally we will learn about different tests for mean variance and proportions and approaches for making a statistical decision so let us first understand what do we mean by these terms what is hypothesis and what does it mean when you say hypothesis testing hypothesis basically is an assertion about the parameters of the population so wherever you make a statement about the parameters of the population note that it is not a statement about the sample statistic that you can make that won't be a hypothesis so for hypothesis it is essential that it is some claim that has been made about the population parameter for instance suppose you want to compare the average monthly income of employees in two different departments then in that case you can denote mu1 as the average monthly income in the first department and likewise mu2 would be the average monthly income in the second department now your interest may be to test whether the average monthly income of the first department is less than that of the second or if it is greater than that are they equal or are they not equal so various situations can be created in which you might be interested so here in this case if you see the last statement here we have written mu1 less than mu2 right or mu1 greater than mu2 so here we are basically making a claim about the parameters of the population it is not about the sample because mu i is if you recall mu i is have been used for the population parameters and we use the corresponding sample mean for x bar right so it is always a statement about the parameters of the population now how do you check the claims suppose a manufacturer of led light bulbs claims that their bulbs have an average life span of 2 hours right somebody is making a claim about their led light bulbs likewise whenever you are conducting this coin tossing experiment we often assume that the coin is unbiased or it is a fair coin so how do you check whether the statements or these assertions are correct or not for this basically we do hypothesis testing so hypothesis testing primarily says that you have to test whether the claim or the hypothesis that has been made is correct or not so for instance if a manufacturer is making any claim about the life span of the led light bulbs then hypothesis this is the claim that he has made now you want to test whether the claim that has been made is correct or not so that basically comes under hypothesis testing okay so here you start with the claim that has been made somebody is already making a claim about the parameter and then you want to test it okay so basically in this we attempt to refute a specific claim about the population parameter based on the sample data okay so for instance if you are considering the manufacturer of led light bulb so he has made a claim that his the average life span of the led light bulb is supposed to say 50000 hours now the quality control engineer there might be interested to see whether the which has been made is correct or not in that case what he will do is that he will then collect a sample from those led light bulbs whatever is the production lot from there he could select random sample of some led bulbs and he would study the life span of each of those so for that he will come up with certain value and based upon that he would finally conclude that the claim which was made is actually correct or not is it actually 50000 hours or if it is less than that 
So whatever you do in this case in hypothesis testing is based upon the sample that you have collected. In estimation, what we did is in point estimation, if you recall, there we were interested in a population parameter. There was no claim about the parameter, right? If the average lifespan of the bulb, so the same experiment, if you think in the estimation purpose, then in that scenario, what will happen? Suppose you, the quality control engineer might be interested to see what is the average lifespan of the bulbs produced in that company. So for that, what he will do, he will select a sample and then he will study certain properties or you say the corresponding sample mean and then he would come up with a single value that this is going to be the lifespan of the LED light bulbs manufactured in this facility. However, in hypothesis testing, what you are doing is you are not starting with the sample first. First, somebody is making a claim about the population parameter. Somebody is claiming that, okay, this is the lifespan. Now you are going to check your interest is into whether the claim that has been made is correct or not. And in order to verify that, then you will collect a sample, make certain formulations and check it, cal do some calculations. And then finally, you would calculate or you would come up with the solution that or the conclusion that this is going to be the correct, this is the correct claim or not. Okay, so hypothesis testing and estimation differs in this, this way. Okay, so there is a little bit of way around how you deal with the sample. Both are based upon the sample only, but the way you start with this sample or you start looking at the sample statistic, that is a bit different in both of these. Now, when we are talking about hypothesis testing, the first two common terms that rise are null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. So null hypothesis, if you might have read somewhere, then null hypothesis are often denoted by this H suffix not. So not basically is to denote null. Okay. So whenever you want to frame a hypothesis as null or alternative, then you have to keep in mind that null hypothesis would always be the statement in which you doubt. Okay. Or you can say that you will frame it in a way that it will have it is a statement of no effect or it is bringing no difference. On the other hand, alternative hypothesis basically is a condition that you believe in. Okay. So given any setup, you might believe in certain condition or you might not believe in that. Right. So in whichever you have doubt that you will write as the null hypothesis and the other one in which you believe in that will be written as the alternative hypothesis. Okay. So sometimes you might have seen that alternative hypothesis are referred to as the research hypothesis and uh, at places they just write alternative hypothesis. If you go to management research and all those studies, so they, are with, they just write the alternative and then based upon the sample, they try to come up whether the, their sample supports this hypothesis or not. Now, let us understand the examples so that you can fully understand the meaning of what is null and alternative. Suppose you are interested to see what is the relation between suppose say education level and job performance. So you know that intuitively also and by experience that if you are educated, your education level is higher, then your job performance would also be better, right? You will be getting the better job offers also. So if you have to make a null and alternative based upon the situation, then you basically believe in that higher education level improves the job performance. So in that case, you will write the alternative as the condition in which you believe. However, the condition in which you doubt is that education level has no influence on the job performance. So that you can frame as the null hypothesis. And why do we do that? That writing null as the condition in which we doubt, we will come to that in the next slide. Similarly, you can consider another example that if you are interested to see whether the heart attack can be linked with drinking coffee or not. So in that case, we know that caffeine is not good for your health. So it would have certain impact on your functioning of heart also. So in this case, you can say that alternative is the one in which you believe. So you can say that drinking coffee increases the chances of heart attack. Rather, the null would be 
the one that you doubt so you can say that heart attack has no link with drinking coffee so it means that you doubt this condition and that is why you have written it as the null hypothesis or maybe you can consider various other examples like if you want to consider the height of children right so if you want to see if the parents have good height then children often tend to have that pick up that height otherwise it is the other way around so you might frame the hypothesis that tall fathers have tall children so in that case you can say that negation statement the one in you doubt in which you doubt it will be the tall fathers don't have tall children something like that you can frame as the null hypothesis an alternative one will be the tall fathers tend to have tall children so whenever you have any given situation you have to first think of two criteria you have to think whether the condition in which you believe in and in which you doubt and the moment you are able to identify that you can quickly write down the null and the alternative based upon that as you can see in these two examples as well now the question comes up is that how do we decide whether to reject the null hypothesis or not how do you decide because we are saying that null hypothesis is the one in which we doubt it means we would like to reject it right because if i am having doubt in something i would not like to prove that i would like to reject that claim so how do we do that we do that by collecting a data and if you find that if the sample data that you have collected is consistent with your null hypothesis then you do not reject it however if the sample data is inconsistent with the null hypothesis but consistent with the alternative you reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the alternative is true so basically you would be collecting a sample in order to test your hypothesis you will collect a sample you will do certain calculations and then finally decide based upon the sample that whether the null hypothesis has to be rejected or not now note that when we say rejecting the null hypothesis it means that it is false you can conclude that it is false however when you say you are accepting the null hypothesis it does not mean that it is true okay it is not true in general it only says that you do not have enough evidence to believe otherwise it is just the sample that is giving you the correct answer right it may not hold true in general so based upon the sample that you have taken it is giving you the result that okay null hypothesis is true so that is why we always talk in terms of whether you reject a hypothesis or you fail to reject a hypothesis okay we it is a wrong practice to say that you accept the null hypothesis acceptance instead of saying we accept we say that we fail to reject it okay so just keep these tricky thing things in mind so that you do not get confused later on now the next question is why do we always try to reject the null hypothesis and why do not we just prove alternative right if i am interested in certain statement and i want to check whether the claim that has been made so why should i write the null hypothesis first which is a negation statement or you can say which is basically the condition in which i doubt and then i try to write another one that is the alternative which is the correct one in which i believe so why should i try to reject the one in which i doubt why just i don't simply write a single hypothesis and say that okay i am trying to going to prove this that would be another approach right because instead of writing two hypotheses and then rejecting the alternate opposite one so that i can accept or you can say i fail to reject that so in that case why don't we simply prove the alternative the reason is that you cannot conclusively affirm a hypothesis but you can conclusively negate it it is difficult to prove something rather it is easier to disprove something because if you can find a single observation or a single data set which rejects the null hypothesis you can say that it is incorrect right you will reject the null hypothesis because whenever you are proving suppose there is any concept and you have to find sometimes you have to find examples in order to prove that sometimes you find a counter example 
in order to show that okay this is not going to happen so you just find a single counter example you do not go and keep on finding different counter examples again and again only a single counter example suffices to say that okay this statement is going to be wrong so here also if you have to reject the null hypothesis if i can find out from the sample that i have it is getting rejected then my job is done so i can easily accept the alternative one instead of proving it because for proving it is not easy so observations inconsistent with the hypothesis will disprove it but if you find that the sample that you have it is not proving it if you are working with the alternative directly and then you cannot say that okay this is going to be true in general also right so instead of that we just try to frame your hypothesis into two parts one is your null the other one is alternative null is the one in which you doubt alternative is the one in which you believe in and finally we try to reject the null hypothesis because we cannot prove conclusively prove that this is the alternative is true so that is why we try to easily negate the null hypothesis and get done with our job so that this is the basic concept of hypothesis testing and we often tend to get confused about these concepts so i am just explaining it to you beforehand so now let us try to understand what are the two types of errors that we encounter in hypothesis testing and why do we come across these two why do we even have these errors so let us look at this table this is a very common and famous table that you can get anywhere in all i think in most of the textbooks it is there so basically when you are making any decision you have two options decisions can be either you reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis likewise the reality can be the null hypothesis can be true and null hypothesis can also be false now error will happen whenever if you look at this particular call this particular cell over here h not is true and you reject it so basically something is true and you are rejecting it it means that you are committing type 1 error right this will be an error however if you come to this second one here it is false and you are rejecting it so that is fine to us because you are not making any mistake there it is not an error so we say that it is correct likewise if you come to the third option so h not is true and you fail to reject it it is correct and you are not rejecting it basically so still it is fine yeah and finally when you come to this one so type 2 error here you are again making a mistake because something is false here you can see it is false and you fail to reject it something is incorrect and you are failing to reject it it means that you are again committing an error and that is referred to as your type 2 error okay so in hypothesis testing we always talk about these two types of errors and these we are actually intuitively also you see that we are bound to make such errors because we are making conclusions based upon the sample and even if the single observation changes the entire conclusion might vary so for that we have we will obviously will come across certain types of mistakes or you can say the errors It, they are commonly referred to as the type 1 and type 2 errors so basically you can keep in mind that if you are rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true you commit type 1 error and the probability of committing this type 1 error is basically referred to as alpha okay so alpha is the probability of committing type 1 error likewise if you fail to reject the null hypothesis when it is false you commit type 2 error so the probability of committing type 2 error is referred to as beta so alpha and beta they are not type 1 and type 2 error you cannot just say this is type 1 and type 2 error it is basically the probability associated with that it is the probability of committing type 1 error which is alpha and the probability of committing type 2 error is beta okay so whenever something is correct and still you are rejecting it it means that it is type 1 error 
and otherwise you say that you fail to reject it when it is false it is referred to as your type 2 error okay also you can think about it from manufacturing point of view because there you will come across consumers risk and producers risk so if you if the manufacturing lot that is there it is good and the consumer rejects it it means that it is good and you are rejecting it then it is basically commit you are committing a type 1 error and that will be producers loss right because something was of good quality and still the consumers have not accepted it so it will be the loss at his end because he has invested so much time and money and effort in that likewise if it is of a poor quality and still the consumer accepts it so in that case it is not good it is false but you are still accepting it you fail to reject that when it is false so it is the consumer's risk so these two are often referred to as producer's risk and consumer's risk in your quality control setup so now let us look at this remark now alpha is referred to as the level of significance so basically alpha is what probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true so another name for that is level of significance the common values for alpha that we take is 0 0.05 0 0.01 and 0.1 when i say alpha is 0 0.05 that is alpha is the level of significance because alpha basically means that it is the probability of rejecting h not given that h not is true right so this is your alpha and when i say that this alpha is 0 0.05 it means that i am willing to take 5% risk of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true okay likewise if alpha is 0 0.01 it would mean that i am willing to take 1% risk of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true so basically you are taking some sort of risk there when you are fixing some alpha value okay so it depends upon the manufacturer or the one who is doing the study that how much risk is he willing to take so it depends upon your problem or your setup and based upon that you can decide whether you need to take alpha as 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 and so on okay so it necessarily whenever we are saying alpha is 0 0.05 so the first thing that should come to your mind is that okay it is level of significance and what does it actually mean we are referring to it as basically the risk that you are willing to take when the null hypothesis is true and you are rejecting it okay and if alpha is smaller your beta the probability of accepting a false null hypothesis would be larger because there is some rejection region and there is some acceptance region so basically when you are decreasing alpha it means you are decreasing the probability of rejection if rejection is decreasing it means the probability of committing beta is increasing all right because then acceptance would increase and in beta what is the definition beta is the probability of failing to reject the null hypothesis when it is false okay so that is why you see that these two types of errors if you decrease one the other would increase and likewise would happen right vice versa would happen so what we do is that we try to fix one and then we try to minimize the other and the general convention is to set up the hypothesis in such a way that type 1 error is more serious error okay so we uh, the whenever you have to frame your null and alternative we just frame it in a way that type 1 is a more serious error that is why we fix it and when we say serious error serious basically refers to when you are dealing with the loss of life okay so that is the most serious condition and that is why in statistical studies we consider type 1 error as the more serious one now let us consider some examples in order to understand this suppose a doctor has to choose between diagnosing a patient with a particular medical condition or stating that the patient does not have that condition okay so either he will say that he has the particular condition medical condition or he would say that he does not have that
or he would say that he does not have it. So basically, he has two op hypotheses. That null hypothesis would be that the patient does not have the medical condition versus the alternative one would be that the patient has that medical condition. Okay. Now, type 1 error will be what? Type 1 error is committed if you are saying reject H0 when H0 is true. Basically, it means H0 is true. It means that the patient does not have the medical condition, but the doctor is rejecting that claim and instead saying that patient has the medical condition. Right? So, same thing is written over here. Basically, that type 1 error is committed if the doctor incorrectly diagnoses the patient with the medical condition. He diagnoses that patient has medical condition when in fact he does not have the condition. Right? So, this is a more serious one. And type 2 would be what? Fail to reject H0 when H0 is false. Something is false. This is false. Okay. Patient does not have the medical condition. This is basically false. It means the patient has the medical condition. Right. Is suffering from that disease. But the doctor fails to reject that. Okay. So he says that patient does not have it. So you are not basically treating that patient. So here also you can say that if the doctor incorrectly diagnoses patient does not have the medical condition when in reality the patient actually has the condition. So this is how you can frame your hypothesis. In a similar way you can look at your second example. Suppose a manufacturer company produces electronic devices and an inspector is responsible for determining whether a specific device meets the quality standards or not. So, the device, you can say the device is not of high quality. It means that the device is not meeting the quality standards. And the other one is the device is of high quality. It means that it meets the quality standard. Now, your null would be reject H0 when it is true. So, you are rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. So, the device is not of high quality, but you are rejecting that claim and you are saying that no, it is of good quality. Again, type 2 would be when the you are failed to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. So, it means that the it would be committed when the device is of high quality. Basically, it meets the standards, but is incorrectly labeled as not meeting the standards. So, this is how you can construct different examples and uh, you can from those examples you can see that what is your type 1 and type 2 error. Now, another thing is about your simple and composite hypothesis. So, basically whenever, so this is another like null and alternative hypothesis, this is another common term that we use whether it is a simple or a composite hypothesis. So the hypothesis which basically specifies a probability model completely is referred to as your simple hypothesis. Otherwise, it is referred to as the composite one. For instance, if x follows normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square, where both are unknown. Now, if you frame your null hypothesis as this, that mu is 0 and sigma square is 1. So, what is happening in this case that you have said that it is coming from normal 0, 1, right? So, now it is known that the distribution is normal, mean is 0 and variance is 1. So, everything is specified about the distribution over here. You know the com probability model completely. However, if you consider this, the other one, that mu is equal to mu naught. Now, this mu naught can be anything, right? Mu naught, because we know that mu is in R. So, mu naught can be any value. So, it is not specified. We do not know it actually. So, in that case, we would say that this is a composite hypothesis. This is not a simple hypothesis because the probability distribution is not specified clearly. Okay. So, here even if your sigma square, suppose sigma square is given to you as 1, is given to you, but still if you are framing mu is equal to mu naught, so, one parameter is not unknown to you. So, 
it won't be known completely so that is why we refer to it as your composite hypothesis now another common term that we are going to use over here in hypothesis testing is the test statistic so basically it is the sample statistic that we have used earlier also so when you use it in hypothesis testing we basically the role of sample statistic here is that based upon that we will decide whether you have to reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject it so that is why we say that it is a test statistic so that is the term that we use here like you have x bar minus mu uh, sigma by root n or you will have x bar minus mu s by root n so all those things these we have studied earlier also right so here the name would be the test statistic now rejection region would be what so basically we would learn about two different approaches for hypothesis testing so for different approaches we need to have two different terms so first approach is basically rejection region approach so one is the rejection region approach so what is a rejection region it is the set of values for the test statistic that leads to rejection of the null hypothesis so basically it would be that region or that set of values in which you are going to reject the null hypothesis however the non rejection obviously the name itself suggests that it would be the set of those values where you fail to reject the null hypothesis so these things would be clear to you as we move ahead in the study so what do they actually mean by looking at different examples so critical value is the value of the test statistic that separate the rejection and the non rejection region suppose it is like this and this is basically some value over here if it is greater than this then we reject it so this particular point over here this would be your critical value right so below this so this is your rejection region and here it would be your acceptance region so if you so that value basically which divides your acceptance and rejection region is referred to as the critical value now this is about the rejection region approach the other approach that we use is the p value approach so let us understand what is p value so p value is basically the smallest significance level that leads us to rejecting the null hypothesis so if you recall from alpha that we have studied earlier alpha is the probability of rejecting the null right when it is true or basically when i said that alpha is 0.05 it means that i can take 5% risk of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true right now in the same facility somebody is taking 5% risk the other one could say no i would take only 0.1% risk right so in that way it can keep on going somebody someone else can say no i would take 0.1 so p value so these are different levels of significance but p value is that significance level that's the smallest significance level that leads us to rejecting the null hypothesis you cannot go beyond that it is that particular value okay this is a very general definition for p value the technical definition would come now so if the p value is small the basic notion is that if the p value is less than the alpha so you will fix an alpha first of all in your study and you will find the p value and if the p value comes out as less than so this is p is basically the p if p value is less than equal to alpha you reject the null hypothesis otherwise you fail to reject it and a smaller p value will favor the alternative right because if the p value is smaller you are rejecting the null hypothesis it means you are accepting the alternative right so that is in that way it is coming from that statement only now the technical definition and the proper definition for p value is basically it is the probability that we would observe a more extreme statistic than we did if the null hypothesis was true this is the important definition this is just for your understanding but and usually come across this but this is the correct definition for p value which says that it is the probability that you would observe a more extreme statistic than you did if the null hypothesis was true so provided the null hypothesis is true would you be observing a more extreme statistic or not so we p value is basically that probability 
that whether you are going to observe a stream extreme statistic or not so to understand this let us consider an example over here suppose a medical researcher is conducting a clinical trial to evaluate the effectiveness of a new drug in reducing the blood pressure the drug is expected to have a mean reduction of 20 mm hg and the standard deviation of 4 now if you frame the hypothesis as that mu is 20 that mean reduction is 20 or the it might be more right whether it is giving you more reduction in that case if you are testing this hypothesis what will happen is you will take the sample mean and if the sample mean comes out as approximately 20 then you would say that your null hypothesis is true and you fail to reject this. so you basically you fail to reject this and you reject the alternative one and if it is high suppose it comes out as 29 or 30 or something then you would say that this is significantly high and you reject the null hypothesis right you would say that the alternative is correct now suppose that you take a random sample of size 36 and you find that the sample mean is just 22 now can you say that 22 is significantly high or not can you conclude it because 22 is very close to 20 right that much margin of error you can have so for that to check whether it is going to happen or not basically can be done using the p value so p value says that if the null hypothesis is true what is the probability that x bar could be as high or higher than 22 so you have observed that x bar is 22 p value would tell you the probability that okay if the null hypothesis is true that is it is actually 20 then what is the probability that you are going to get a mean greater than 22 or not right because if you understand the scenario that null hypothesis is 22 20 sorry null hypothesis is given to you it means for the population parameter is 20 now you are taking a sample then you are getting 22 p value is saying that given that the null hypothesis is true it means that there is a a population whose mean is 20 20 then what is the probability that you could get a value 22 or more than that so that probability is basically calculated by this p value concept so here if you see probability that x bar could be 22 or greater than that you are going to observe test statistic will take 22 or an extreme statistic provided that mu is 20 that is the null hypothesis is true okay now you know that you can standardize that so you subtract x bar minus mu okay divided by sigma by root n so this one would be z here so in this case it would be 22 here you subtract in this side so mu x bar 22 minus 20 over sigma sigma is 4 given to you and you are given 36 right so basically this becomes your z and you solve this probability that z is greater than or equal to 2 this is same as 1 minus of that and if you look at the table this basically comes out as 0.00135 so this probability is basically the p value and this is very very small so under the null hypothesis what you have observed is highly unlikely basically it means that if the population parameter is 20 population mean is 20 then it is highly unlikely that you would get a sample mean of 20 22 or more than that okay so in that case it means you are going to reject the null hypothesis and you would conclude that it is in fact greater than 20 because a hyp null hypothesis is what mu is, mu mu is 20 not mu not but mu is 20 and the other one is that mu is greater than 20 so you uh, under this condition it is not going to happen it means it would be this so you can conclude that the medicine that has been that they are trying to introduce over here is basically that drug is effective right because it is given giving a uh, it is lowering the bp by more than 20 so in general whenever p value is less than alpha 
you reject the null hypothesis. So the general test procedure for hypothesis testing is that first of all you have to state the null and the alternative one. Then you will find the test statistic that is the sample statistic. Next you would adopt either the rejection region approach or the p-value approach and then based upon that you would check the assumptions and draw conclusions. So here in this case you would if you obtain this, if you adopt this rejection region approach, you will be dealing with the critical value and you would be comparing it with that. And in this value, p-value, again, you will be calculating the p-value. So p-value is a more reliable method. And we will see why p-value is a good one as we do the examples. So we'll consider an example and then we will see in both the ways what is the answer, right? And why p-value is better. And finally, you will check the assumptions and draw conclusions. So rather, I would say that assumptions would be checked first of all here only. So you will draw conclusions in the end. So we have studied till now. What is a hypothesis? What do you mean by null and alternative hypothesis? And the basic concept behind hypothesis testing why do we need it? Why are we rejecting the null? Why are we not proving it? Right? What do we mean by when you are rejecting the null hypothesis? Then we came to the two different types of errors that we come across in hypothesis testing. What are those? What is meant by them? What is the technical meaning behind them? And we saw different examples for that. Then we came across some important terms again, which included your simple and the composite hypothesis. Then we came across your test statistic, rejection and non-rejection region, critical value, p-value. And we have seen the general test procedure here. So after this, we are going to learn about in different setups, like when you are going to test for mean or variance or proportion. So how do you do the hypothesis testing in those scenarios? Okay, thank you.